Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here in Hone U and BD Lectures uh, series. And today I'm very flattered to have Professor Jorge Dais from Barranquilla, Colombia. Dr. Dais is a good friend and a world expert on abdominal wall surgery. And he's actually right now uh, the director of minimum invasive surgery at Clinica Porto Azul in Barranquilla, Colombia. He is the inventor or creator of a new technique that is now worldwide spread that we call ETAP. And that will be his main uh, topic on this uh, next 34, uh, 35 to 40 minutes is really describe his own experience on creating and developing this new technique. Dr. Dice has training in, in Colombia and in the United States. He is, I, I don't know he's too present, I think he's past president of the Columbia Surgical Society. He is a governor of American College of Surgeon and is a really a, an honor to have him here with us. Um, we will have uh, questions on our chat box that we will address at the end of the presentation. Um, just to give a quick update, Jorge, we have people from Turkey, Australia, Colombia, for sure, Argentina, uh, Brazil, Italy, uh, <clears throat> Qatar, uh, Greece, Mexico, uh, who else? Chile. And so it's a truly global present, Iran, uh, India is truly uh, a global presentation, and I am very happy to be able to give them you and your uh, experience and your uh, minds for them for the next 40 minutes. So, again, thank you for doing this on these crazy times, and at the end, we'll have enough time to address all the questions from our global partners here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Flavio, for a kind introduction. I would like to thank also to BD and to Hernia and you for the opportunity to be here today, and especially to Jennifer Petri for the coordination of this event. And to all of you out there who believe that even if a ship is safe in a harbor, uh, that's not what ships are made for. Surgery is not a harbor activity. So constant improvement and the pursuit of excellence are not uh, optional for us surgeons. Uh, this presentation will have three parts. The first one, we will describe the history of how ETEP was conceived. We will give credit to all the people who have uh, collaborated in uh, making it better to teach and disseminate the concept of the ETEP. In the second part, we will discuss all the setups for the ETEP inguinal hernia repair and also uh, special steps of circumstances in which this technique is uh, especially befitting. And finally, we will have a lively discussion with uh, Flavio as our coordinator so all the questions you have, you can uh, channel them through him. So, in the late 80s, I started my surgical practice in Barranquilla, a port and city, uh, and a seaport in the north coast of Colombia. A uh, city difficult to pronounce, but very easy to live in. After a few years, we foresaw the importance of minimal invasive surgery, as did many around the world. But with practically no data, we couldn't convince the most uh, glamorous institutions in the city to back up our program. So we have to move to a small hospital, Clinica Bautista, where a formidable Texas surgeon and uh, uh, friend, 
really believe and support our uh, ideas. Just after a few years, we realized uh, and we, we were disappointed with the results of the open inguinal hernia repair and uh, encouraged by a strong and resilient figure, Dr. Ed Felix, with his convincing arguments and his uh, baseball cap always turned backwards, uh, fighting the establishment at the ACS clinical meetings, we were convinced that we have to make the switch to minimal invasive inguinal hernia repair and never look back. So we, the TEP technique was all already described in both sides of the Atlantic by McKernan, Fersley, and Duluth. So we descended in Memphis, where a Southern gentleman, Dr. Guy Beller, was uh, conducting one of the most popular ETEP courses in the world. The technique Dr. Beller has taught since, and we taught regionally for years, has been unaltered for over 25 years. And for our disappointment, this technique has very low implementation rate. The reasons for that, we believe, are the limited surgical field, the restricted pore setup, the low tolerance to accidental pneumoperitoneal, the poor ergonomics, and it's difficult to teach and learn. Nevertheless, we still believe that the TAEP TEP technique was at least in theory, the closest to ideal. So one sleepless, sleepless night in uh, 2009, where we were considering ways to improve the surgical field to facilitate the technique, we conceived the ETEP access uh, concept. The small e stands for uh, enhanced and uh, lately has been more popular extended uh, uh, identification with E. And we define today the ETEP as a set of uh, maneuvers and strategies undertaken to potentiate a usable extra peritoneal space for the repair of inguinal, ventral, and lumbar hernia. And what are those maneuvers and strategies? Well, the remote access to the hernia, the creation of the space, the flexibility in putting the ports, the division of its natural boundaries when necessary. So after a few, as you can see here, the strap blue lines represent all the areas where you can access the extra peritoneal space with the ETEP technique while the red spot shows the area where the TEP takes place almost always. And uh, the direct access to the preperitoneal space from outside of the semilunar line is possible, as you can see here, for the repair of lumbar hernias, for example. So we, in few months, have collected over 30 ETEP inguinal hernia repair, some of them in very complex cases. And we published our results first in Spanish in the uh, Surgical, Colombian Surgical Association Journal and the Mexican Endoscopic Surgical Association Journal. It was uh, rejected at, at the beginning in hernia, but it was finally accepted in 2012 in Surgical Endoscopy in English. So that was our first publication in English. We move on to repair other hernias, like small low, hand, low ventral hernias, especially M5, suprapubic ventral hernias after fine incisions, for example, and spigillian hernias. And we also published the first ETEP axis from lateral to the semilunar line for the repair of a lumbar hernia. In that case was a L4 uh, hernia. But we have to say that this technique would have been a somewhat provincial 
technique, if not for a group of very smart surgeons and close friends that we have dubbed the band of brothers. Uh, Eric Polai and Sean Orestin has uh, uh, collaborated to the field of hernia in, in Normandy. Uh, Conrad Balliser has been a stalwart defender of the critical view of the malpatineal orifice, allowing the safe introduction of the robotic inguinal hernia repair. Uh, David Chen help us conceptualize the ETEP, considering more like a concept than a technique, a way to potentiate the extraperitoneal space beyond the retius and bogus spaces, so familiar for us, for the repair of uh, a diverse types of hernia and also to do it other procedures like triple neurectomy. But it was Igor Beliansky who were closing, uh, working closely with us who really revolutionized the field when he described the crossover, a way to go from one retro, uh, retro space to another safely. And with it, he introduced the ETEP RIFs and ETEP TAR procedures. He also published the first uh, article on, uh, it was a multinational, multi-center study on ETEP for ventral hernia repair. And it was co-authored for us and uh, by Ramada Balasubramanian, a very uh, brilliant and tenacious uh, Indian surgeon who helped disseminate uh, the concept in India, and also for Victor Raru and others. Yuri Novitsky, not only describes the posterior component separation tar, which I believe is the most important advancement in uh, abdominal wall reconstruction in the last two decades, but also uh, during his uh, visit to Barranquilla very uh, long time ago, he witnessed one of an ETEP inguinal hernia procedures and invited us to write a chapter in his now very popular textbooks of hernia. And finally, Brian, with uh, Brian Jacob at the helm, the International Hernia Collaboration Facebook, Facebook uh, group has allowed a worldwide dissemination of the ETEP concept. Of course, there are many others like BD and uh, Flavio who has helped now disseminate the, the ETEP concept. Salvador Morales who invited me without knowing me at that time to perform an ETEP uh, inguinal hernia repair live in Seville, that was in 2005 or four, and uh, many others that uh, I'm not uh, naming today. The second part of this presentation is the ETEP approach describing the most common port setups and the situation where it's useful. This is uh, one of the port setups, it's from the flank opposite the hernia side, There's the hernia is on the left side. The advantages are the arc line interferes very little with the space. The space created is uh, great and we have triangulation. The other uh, port setup is uh, with the camera port at the upper lateral quadrant on the, uh, of the abdomen on the same side of, as the hernia. As the camera has to travel some space to go into the extraperitoneal space, the arcodial interferes a little bit with this procedure and has to be divided often. We will show you how we do that. This is a left inguinal hernia, initial incision, 12 millimeter incision is in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen. We dissect the extraperitoneal space, a slight uh, balloon dissector, inflated, and through the inflated balloon, we can observe a left direct hernia. We deflate the balloon and replace it with a blunt tip, a, a normal, regular 12 millimeter port, being careful not to activate the blade.
then we irrigate through the umbilicus to prepare the place for the left working pore. Then we make an incision, in this case inside the umbilicus, and place a five millimeter pore keeping the same angle as we did with the needle. We have to have a memory there to memorize the angle of the needle so we facilitate the placement of the pore. We place a, a we introduce a dissector to prepare the area for our right hand working port on their vision with the help of a syringe and irrigation, as you can see here. This is the final port set up. Surgeon and the assistant stand on the same side, opposite the hernia sac. As I mentioned before, with this approach, the arcuate eye sometimes interfere with the vision of the space and we divide it, we introduce a scissor through the lowest port. We try to uh, dissect peritoneum free from the posterior fascia, uh, observing the scissor through the transparent fascia ensures a safe division. Even a small division of the arcuate line uh, procure a really great space. But you can do it on their vision by introducing a five millimeter camera through the lowest uh, port and a dissector through the upper port. So as you can observe here, we dissect peritoneum free from the posterior sheath and then we divide the arcuate line and the sheath medial to the semilunar line. We didn't know nine years ago that we were performing a bottom-up tap. tap. This patient has a right inguinal hernia and now we are going to make the first incision in the left flank, seven centimeter lateral, two to three centimeter cephala to the umbilicus. We slip the uh, balloon over the fascia until we pass the arcuate line and then we turn it to the right side, we inflate it, then we deflate it and replace it by another 12 millimeter port. You can observe here how the arcuate line interferes very little with the space, with the vision of the space, with this approach. Now we try and fail to see the needle and irrigation through the umbilicus. So we changed our approach and now we are preparing the area for the left working port. And now on their vision, we are going to place, to place first the left hand working port high in the lower uh, left quadrant. And now through this one, we can use a dissector and scissors to divide a little bit the arc line so we can now observe the irrigation and place on the vision our right working port. But there are many optional uh, places where you can place the port, we can discuss it uh, lately. For bilateral hernias, we use exactly the same approach we just used right now, but we advise placing an additional five millimeter port on the right in this case, so we can facilitate the repair of the contralateral hernia. I believe the most important aspect of the ETEP is that it facilitates the, the establishment of the critical view of the myopectineal orifice, especially step five, like in this large inguinoscoral hernia in which the sac goes deep into the scrotum. As we traction laterally the sac and dissect the elements of the core medially without really touching them, we proceed until we find a space between the two that we have uh, named the bluish transparency. You see it there, which uh, signals that now you can divide the sac safely and continue with the parietalization of the elements of the core.
This is uh, facilitated by the ETEP because the space that it provides and this place where the camera is allows this uh, proximal dissection. But sometimes the dissection or the parietalization should continue cephala in order to prevent these elements of the core hanging up in the space, forcing tenting of the mesh over them. So now you can see that we really completed the step five. One other maneuver facilitated by the ETEP approach is the prevention of the seroma by management of the distal sac, by tractioning the lateral border of the divided distal sac until we, you see that the uh, pneumo scrotum disappears and fixing it high and lateral onto the posterior wall to prevent seroma formation. We have done that for years and it's a very effective way to do it. ETEP facilitates implementation of step eight. Any mechanical fixation like this one should proceed at least two centimeter above an imaginary line between the anterior posterior iliac spine, anterior superior iliac spine. And in this way, it is very high from any nerve. It's safely to do it there. As you can see here, that's the ACEs and that's our point of fixation. ETEP also makes, makes it easy, step nine, to place a properly sized mesh like this uh, 17 by 15 centimeter soft mesh. Well, step seven is one of the less understood and more controversial step of the critical view. After dissecting a lipoma, we place a dissector behind this lipomatous structures lateral to the uh, internal orifice and traction downward and cephalate, we put those elements under tension and far from the posterior wall, making it easy to divide them using small bursts of low uh, voltage coterie. The nerves are not hanging in the middle of the space, are against the posterior wall and therefore are preserved with this maneuver. This maneuver allows the mesh to be accommodated, the lateral inferior border of the mesh is going to be accommodated deep into the pelvis, therefore preventing its displacement and facilitating its integration. This is the ETEP, the critical view of the malpectinal orifice as seen with an ETEP bilateral approach. It's a 55-year-old male patient with a history of uh, falling from great height five years uh, before. He had an osteosynthesis of the for pelvic fracture through a very long fan steel incision. He was complaining of progressive bulging, especially on the right side. We approached this patient with an ETEP approach. This is the final view of the dissection and as you can observe, this is more like an incisional hernia with total loss of the posterior wall more than a direct hernia. But in these cases, it allows the placement of very large meshes like this one and its fixation, in this case with a combination of sutures and tacks. We have followed this patient for now three years without recurrence. This final view with both meshes covering the myopectinal orifice. Another uh, indication for the ETEP approach is this left sliding hernia in which you can open the sac, verify where the cool de sac is, where the colon is, and despite the air seeping into the peritoneal cavity and a pneumoperitoneum developing, it doesn't interfere with the completion of the procedure.
So now we are following the steps of the critical view. We carefully close the peritoneum after verifying that the organs remain sound and placing a properly sized mesh. Fi Finally, another uh, indication for the ETEP approach is this right incarcerated uh, inguinal hernia in which we again open the sac, reduce the greater momentum into the extra peritoneal cavity, put the patient in a, into a deep uh, Trendelenburg uh, position, reduce the content in the intraabdominal cavity, and go on with the steps of the critical view. Those are some examples in which ETEP is befitting. Uh, and with this, uh, we finish our presentation. I look forward to your questions. Flavio? Thank you, Jorge. Um, it was a, a great presentation, as uh, as always. Um, I will have, we'll start to have my, some questions here. The first one is from Edmundo Inga from Peru. He was discussing in your historical presentation if it was not Professor Duluc from France, the first one to detail uh, des describe the tap. Oh, well, in the history, according to some uh, articles by Ed Felix and others, uh, Duluc in France uh, was uh, described the tap technique. But uh, you know, in the history, history of hernia is very controversial, almost always, about who did what. And everybody used to put their names in all the techniques. But uh, that's what I, I really uh, could find about the pioneers of that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think the, in the US, the guys, they did a TP by an accident. They were trying to do a tap. TAPP and they by accident. But the look is very known from the early descriptions of TAP, TP, and it was really a pioneer on a non fixation concept for TP. So I give him a lot of credit, thousands of cases without fixation. Mm -hmm. And I think it was really an eye opener for us that the lack or the less need of fixation that we have on this uh, uh, TP technique. So a uh, question, <clears throat> do you, from Dr. Biral Ag Agka, do you think that the biggest, the bigger dissection, the, you have more seroma on that space? Well, two things. If you, if with your current minimally invasive approach, for inguinal hernia, you are comfortable following the steps of the critical view. You don't need more space. You continue doing what you're doing and probably reserve ETEP for older cases. For us that believe that ETEP uh, can be done uh, routinely because, because it facilitates all the steps, we haven't observed uh, an increased rate of uh, seroma formation. We believe seroma formation depends on leaving a uh, dead space. So if you really address that problem in the direct approach by reducing and fixing the transversalis, the lax transversalis fashion, or in the indirect uh, uh, hernia by, by reducing the whole sac, which is also problematic, but you can get the orchitis and uh, hematomas and other problems, or by doing what you just saw now, you won't have a great amount of seroma formation. Probably all patients had uh, a small degree of seroma that disappears without being clinically important, but clinically important seromas are now rare in our practice. And we use uh, ETEP routinely. 
Yeah, uh, seromas uh, should not be an issue on this technique because it's peritoneal dissection. So uh, the peritoneum is very highly capable to absorb fluids. So uh, seroma has never been an issue for TAPP or TAP. Hematomas are an issue and it's usually related to patient factors or technique factors. But is a big space, yes, but it's in a preparatory space. So probably should not be a problem. Uh, probably should not be a problem. So it's a question from Hafta Alo Layan. Why it, is it enhanced? Why is it different from the classic TP? I think that's, that the answer is easier. And I'll, I ask you to allow me to answer if I got it right. Is, is enhanced because you have a bigger operative space. By the way that you position your ports, you have a bigger space to work. Uh, I'm a TEP surgeon, and when I always try to teach TEP, I say to the students that it's like going to the movies and sit on the first row. So you are always very close to your, your operative area. And that is the beauty of ETAP. By changing the port position, you step back. So you have this enhanced view of your operative field. I think that is the difference between, and with, and with that, you are, it allows you to get all the advantage that you uh, described. Uh, a question from Julio Jesus Suarez Valencia. Which will be the, limit, the limitation or limitations for your technique? Well, the main, limitation of the technique is lack of proper training. That's for sure. You need a proper training to do this technique. This is nothing that you can just watch a video and go back and do it in a patient. You want to learn it in a course of a weekend course on ETEP. This technique as all the extra peritoneal techniques require proper training, a stepwise training. So that's the main limitation of the technique. I would, see, I would say the use of balloon is optional. The trockers you can use reusable. There is no uh, limitation because of, uh, of the material available because it can be done with, uh, with the same material you do a tap or others. The main limitation is training in my point of view. So a uh, question from Dr. Gandhi. Um, why did you use a lightweight mesh on that case of the pelvic trauma that you show? Would not be better to use a regular heavyweight mesh? Well, Jing has a great eyes because that is true. Because we didn't have it available at the moment. But what we did is to put two meshes in, in the right side that was the big side. We used two meshes and we overlapped them. But I, I'm surprised he could see he could see that. But that that was our solution for our problem. We we put an extra large 3D mesh, 3D mesh in every place, and then on the right side put one inverse. So we cover the whole thing uh, widely, and uh, we fix it especially uh, uh, aggressively in this case. Uh, we don't usually do that. And we do it in, in this case because we didn't use the proper weight mesh. That it should be, uh, should have been a, a heavy weight. Okay, uh, question from Dr. Jorge Ospina. What, what do you do when the peritoneum is open? Well, that's a great question from a great professor. Uh, the, the thing is, you have a hole in the peritoneum because there is air. When you don't have air there, the border of that defect come together and you don't have a hole anymore. So if you have a small tear of peritoneum during knee tap or tap, you should, be, uh, you should uh, just check that the end of the procedure, do you release the CO2 in a controlled manner and watch the borders come together? If you do that, you don't need to do anything else. It will keep, it will uh, uh, be kept uh, closed. That's for sure. We have 
confirm that we have uh, going inside the cavity we have a tip for taps video on all the uh, possibilities when you have a tear now if you have a huge tear well you have to close it and uh, the beauty of the e tap is that allows easy uh, handling of uh, suturing endosuturing so my answer is in the great majority of uh, defect or tears you don't need to do anything just to make sure that CO2 is released in a proper uh, manner. Otherwise, if CO2 remains in the space, you will have a, a hole there. And I, I think the same ap applies for the TAP procedure, but I won't discuss that today. So, uh, Dr. Agka, what is your main purpose for doing ETAP? Why do you do ETAP? To tell you the truth, I was doing TEP for years and I didn't have any problem with TEP. I love TEP, but I couldn't teach TEP. I, I, I went from all Latin American trying to teach uh, TEP. If you observe the rate of implementation of TEP in the residents in the US, which I, I have followed from 1997 on, it started at 12% and today is still 30%. 35%. That's it. In 25 years, it didn't have this uh, implementation. So I was looking for ways to teach that better, to, to find a way to mod modify it just to make it more palatable, palatable for surgeons. And in the way, we found that we can do a lot of things by working in the extra peritoneal space. So it is spawned all the techniques you heard uh, during the history part of this presentation. Yeah, I think the answer is it's just easier to teach and once you learn it, it's easier to do than a regular TP. Um, there's a question here, the port at the umbilicus nearly always fights with the camera port. How do, how do, avoid, how do, you, do, how do you avoid this? I think the answer is, you answered this in, in, in your presentation, you do your higher camera port more lateral. Yeah. You mentioned that, three centimeters, seven centimeters, you are above the umbilicus and lateral, more lateral. You need to understand the rectal sheath has in average seven centimeters, 6.5, 7, 7.5 centimeters. So you try to stay lateral on the rectal sheath. That is different from the traditional tap TP that we stay medial on the rectus when we approach an umbilical area. By doing this, you move away your camera from the midline. So that's why you collide less. Yeah, that's, that's a perfect answer. I, I would add just that even in the upper lateral approach, in the upper lateral quadrant of the abdomen, the camera should be moved a little bit uh, more lateral. And you don't have to use the umbilicus because not all patient has the same uh, body. So you can change your technique, you can do it outside the umbilicus. I, I, I really use the umbilicus for two reasons, because a concomitant umbilical hernia is frequent and because I try to hide one of the incisions. But otherwise you, you can do, you can place the other port even on the left side or the right side, if you want. There is flexibility so, on that. A question from Dr. Ha Moody. Be honest, which do you prefer, contralateral or ipsilateral approach? Likely from a contralateral approach. Contralateral approach, okay. Yeah. Any tips or tricks on obese patients from Dr. Kopiklak? Well, that is one of the advantages from my point of view of the e -tap, because you can go above the paniculus. So <coughs> in those cases, what I do is to do a subcostal approach to the axis of the e -tap. So the camera port is going to be two, 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 three centimeters under the costal margin. We angle the table accordingly, the operating table accordingly, and doing that, especially in the post-bariatric patient, the post-bariatric patient is still fat in the inguinal region. So if you 
put the camera there is going to make uh, much easier an extrapretoneal approach on, on those patients. Otherwise, you have the open approach that you'll be in the middle of the paniculus, or you have the tech that is still in the middle of the paniculus. So I think it's a good option to do an e -tap. Have uh, Dr. Fuentes, Francisco Fuentes, have you ever resect bowel for a strangulated hernia during an ETAP? And what would be your recommendation? Mash, no mash? Yeah, I, I haven't done a resection for uh, in the extra peritoneal space. My recommendation is always to go intra peritoneal in those cases in which you suspect an uh, uh, strangulated hernia. You reduce the content and you can do an extra peritoneal, uh, an intra peritoneal resection of the bowel involved. Then you have two options close the defect and come back later on, or you can do a second uh, setup. You wash your hands again, skin preparation, dress the patient again, and do an extra peritoneal approach then. I, I have done the, the last one. You can do that also. I'm very conservative with the, where you have uh, uh, contamination. I know that the statistics says that the risk of infection is very low, but I, I tend to think that even if it's low, if it's present, it's going to be a catastrophe. So I try to avoid that. So if there is really contamination, I'll avoid it. If it's a, a small uh, disruption without contamination, I'll go and put a mesh. Go on and put a mesh. Uh, I have a question from Dr. Scott Laker. How do you manage a large indirect set on ETAP because he is concerned that uh, this large sac can slide under the inferior edge of the mesh. So when he does TAPP, he kind of incorporates the sac into the peritoneal closure. Well, the problem, but you, if you reduce the sac, you can do that. But if you have a, a distal sac remaining deep into the scrotum, well, that, that's it is a problem. But let, let me put it in this way. If you have a large inguinoscrural hernia, you have two options. If you try to dissect the sac all the way to the uh, scrotum, you can do it. You can, you can reduce the whole sac, but the price is going to be more hematomas, uh, or chiris, uh, and, uh, and seromas, still seromas. But if you divide the sac, and if the distal sac is small, you can leave it alone. As uh, Flavio mentioned, the seroma is going to be self-limited. But if it's a large sac, I think we should do something about it. When I, when I left those very large sacs, I have seromas, and I have to go back to some of them to resect the distal sac through the scroll. So uh, when we change to this practice of reducing the sac, and fix it in, into the wall, lateral and high, well, we, we, don't, we haven't seen uh, any more seromas. Now, if you're concerned about the mesh integration that is limited because there is a, a peritoneum over there, over the wall, well, it's going to be very limited because if you put a large enough mesh, it's going to be integrated all around this place. So I, I don't see that as, a, as an obstacle. Yeah, so uh, what I pay attention when I do TAPs, TPs, or ETAPs for large indirect sacs that if you re when you reduce them, I make sure I hold them up when I disinsufflate the peritoneum, make sure they lie on top of the mesh and not on the inferior edge. So I think that will uh, address Dr. Laker's uh, concern. So this, the, the, the sac sliding under. Uh, Dr. Ezequiel Pomzon from Argentina, do you fix a hernia, a hernia defects bigger than three centimeters? How do you fix them? Tackers, sutures? Well, I have changed with time. I used to use uh, tackers all the time. Then I replace it by, by glue. And uh, in the last 
five years, the ones, the few that I fix, I use sutures. Especially, as I mentioned, it's inexpensive, it's easy. You can place the suture exactly where you want. And let me tell you something about fixation. You can fix it to the Coopers or beyond the ACES line as we described, but you can fix it to the uh, psoas muscle. If, if you watch carefully the place where you're going to place it over the psoas, you don't have a problem placing a suture there. So the advantage of the suture is uh, price. It's easy to do if you have the training. The ETEP gives you the space to do it. And you can do it even in places, if you need it, you can do it in places where it's usually contraindicated. Uh, and another point on fixation, if you try to fix the sac, the, this large sac to the wall to prevent seroma with a tag, the tag doesn't have enough purchase to accommodate the uh, sac and fix it to the wall. So that's, uh, that's a drawback of tags, the limited purchase they have. That's a, so uh, Conrad has a question. So your ETA procedure has disseminated worldwide. What is your recommendation for surgeons on how to transition from TP to ETP without the possibility of being mentored by other surgeons? That's that are what we discussed earlier. So I do TP. I want to try ETP next week. I don't have anyone to help me. What will be your recommendation? Well, it should be done in a stepwise approach. First of all, well, if you are an expert of that, I, I bet you don't have to do a lot of things. You have uh, available videos in the ISC and the BD Hernia U in the YouTube. Everywhere you have videos. You have uh, telementoring. You have um, uh, many resources. But I strongly recommend going to the cadaver model. For me, that is the best way to learn ETEP. The cadaver model, and Conrad is an expert on that, and he has uh, uh, conducted many uh, uh, successful uh, cadaver courses, is the best model to learn ETEP not only for inguinal hernias, but also for ETEP rib stopa, ETEP uh, tar, ETEP uh, lumbar. I strongly always recommend to have a mentee. Uh, I think uh, now is, uh, the technique is, has been so widespread that I, I certainly, you'll find in any continent an expert who can teach you how to do it and to help you in your first cases. That should be the ideal. Yeah, so if I can uh, add some comments on this answer is watch videos, 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 and video as much as you can. Have a five millimeter camera so you can change the camera position to give you more versatility during the procedure if you need. Don't hesitate to cut the arcuit line. And I think those are, I think, my advice. So we are running on the last 10 minutes and we have like dozens of questions. So let's try to make, uh, I'll try to make the questions faster and you kind of fire rapid me back. So uh, oh, use or not the balloon dissection to lower cost. My answer is there's no problem to do without a balloon. I, when I used to work in Brazil, that was one my to go procedure in my university hospital. I never used a balloon. For me, they help a lot, but if you don't have them, it's something that not contraindicate your procedure. Do you have any experience without a balloon? Yes, I have done without balloon when the, I don't have the balloon. But let me tell you something about that. The use of balloon in, in a studies, randomized studies, has shown that it reduces time and bleeding. Uh, secondly, you have available many varieties now and brands of balloon, but choose the round balloon, the simplest you can have. That's all you need. You don't need this fancy things to, to, to make the procedure. You can find a balloon for a hundred dollars, a good balloon. So if that's the, the problem, price or disponibility, we, we don't have problems now with that. Okay. 
So a question about if you have any collision, if you put another port, yes, you said that the port placement is very flexible. If you think that is necessary to put an extra five, there's no problem in put. I, I used to tell my resident fives, fives are free. So if you have any difficult, just put another port. Um, if you need to convert, uh, how do you convert? I think you just make a white flap and position your ports inside the cavity and do a TAPP. There's nothing different on this. Um, what would be your exclusion criteria? Which patients you would not uh, attempt IE tap? That, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And uh, if the patient had a previous extra peritoneal approach, especially with mesh, I would go tap without any doubt. If you are not an expert in the extra prison approach and you have a recurrence or re-recurrence, go anterior, do a leech thing, don't try this. I, I've done all my posterior approach, but those are difficult cases. Uh, same as if you have a, a previous open prostatectomy, which I do routinely, those are the most difficult cases to address by ETEP. Previous, uh, uh, open radical prostatectomies and large sliding areas. Those are difficult. They are not for beginners. In those cases, I prefer TAP. Now, yeah. if the patient have a low physiologic reserve, especially respiratory uh, limitations, I would go with a local uh, procedure, uh, probably a lichstein technique. But I have done in cardiac patients, ETEP with uh, local anesthesia and sedation, but that needs first to be an expert, second to have an easy case, and third to have an anesthesiologist that really is a, a good one in local and sedation to do this. So, yeah, I think the hardest case for me, uh, there are the sliding hernias and the previous preperitoneal manipulation, mainly with prior meshes. Those are really, really difficult in my, at my hands. Question from Dr. Singh from India. Uh, do you do all your harness by ETAPs? I think you answered that, yes. Is your one to go procedure, unless something else happens. Um, there's a question here that we don't have time to answer is from Dr. Kapadia. You mentioned ETAP for lateral hernias, for L4 hernias. That is a whole new lecture on how to do. This is not inguinal hernias, they're lateral inguinal hernias. You do your rectus, posterior rectal sheet exploration. You kind of access the lateral by doing a TAR and then you have your uh, access for this. But I really don't think that we have time to go over this. Quickly, do, when you have a large direct hernia, you want to plicate your transversalis fascia, you rather do it against the rectus or the Cooper's ligament? What do you rather? Excellent question. It depends. If you have a very redundant, lax transversalis fascia, I do it over the wall and not over the Cooper's ligament for one reason because then it's going to interfere with mesh, mesh fixation at this, uh, at this place. And we suppose it's a large hernia, more than three centimeters. So in those cases, I fix it. So if you fix a very redundant sac to the Cooper's ligament, it's going to be very difficult to fix the mesh against the Cooper. So in those cases, I prefer to fix it to the wall. Okay. Um, there's some question about contraindication. We talk about this. Several questions about the balloon. We already discussed this. Uh, Ezekiel is insisting on the defects over three centimeters. Uh, you rather do suturing, as you just said. Um, advantage, you just answered that. Um, do you ever use a various needles? Do, when you have a hole or perforation on the peritoneal, do you ever use a various needle to decompress the cavity or you don't think that is necessary? I used to do it when I, when I uh, was undertaking TEPs. Now with the TEPs, I found that uh, really, rarely needed. Be sure the patient is relaxed. That's one of the pitfalls of ETEP we haven't mentioned before. ETEP and TEP requires perfect relaxation. So ask the anesthesiologist to give you a uh, 
complete relaxation, especially in the first uh, minutes in the creation of the space. If you have the muscle re uh, relaxed, it's going to be much easier to do an extra peritoneal procedure. Um, in our training experience, what would be an average learning curve from a patient uh, for a surgeon does TP to transition to ETP? I know that learning curve is very particular, but if you need to give me a number, what would be your average number that a surgeon will be comfortable transition from TAP to ETAP? Well, I have, uh, I have, uh, have the opportunity to test that on my trainees and my partners. Some of them were beginning, like uh, Dr. Luque with us, and it took her at least uh, 15 procedures to be proficient. But on the other side, we have someone who was already an expert in TEP, Andres Hansen, and he, he switched to ETEP uh, in the next case. And uh, he's a really good example of the comparison between TEP and TAP because in Caracas, where he used to work, he undertook all his procedures TEP. And now when he moved here, he, he found it was really different and uh, he stick to it that now and he defend that so we have the experience with the not uh, the, the one who is uh, starting a learning curve and the expert it differs the curve in, in in both but i think 15 cases is, is enough yeah remember you don't have to to do the long learning curve the pioneers had to do now you have the anatomy the courses the video you have mentors all over, you have better equipment, so you don't have to do the long 200 cases that used to be described in the learning curve of those procedures. Yeah, I have another question about obesity, and first of all, try to lose weight, but ETAP really help you on the obesity uh, learning curve. We discussed this, Eduardo Parradavla is asking how he can learn from you, because he needs some transition from tap to tap, to tap. Uh, which pressure do you use on CO2? Uh, uh, usually 12 millimeters. Wow. Um, but Eduardo doesn't need to need for, <laughs> to learn from me. I am learning from him all, all the time. Uh, Dr. Inga from Peru asked, uh, any consequence by cutting the medium arc with line? Probably not. We, the TAR show us that is not ma a main consequence to this. And this is a limit uh, incision is just for a couple of centimeters, not really a full, uh, a full release of a posterior rectal sheet. Um, do you have any experience with glue attacks? Parmesan is insisting on the fixation. Ezekiel, he uses sutures. I know that glues or tacks can be used, but he likes to do suturing. But we all know that we can do whatever we want. There is not really uh, a difference on this. Um, uh, Inus Crotos, it, it taps a great option as we discussed. Arid Ornelas, my good friend uh, from Brazil. Um, do you have any problems with the epigastric vessels when you do this more lateral approach in the rectus? Probably not. The epigastrics are uh, positioned on the lower uh, end of the rectus. Uh, when we go higher, is, you need to understand that he's he, 12 minutes apart on the rectus is very high, is uh, almost on the upper quadrant. So that's not an issue with the epigastrium in that area. Do you okay, have a 30, do let, you do let, a 30 let, degree scope or a 45 degree scope? No, 30, 30 degree. But may I add something on the last uh, question? Sure. It, prevention is the clue. You have to, to uh, make the incision with transillumination. Plus illumination can show you where the epigastrics are. Always put the ports under vision, as we show it, with the help of uh, syringe and uh, irrigation. And after placing the port, if you observe bleeding, you make a, a, a mental note of that. At the end of the procedure, you should remove that port under vision to be sure it's not bleeding. We have two cases of hematoma because we oversaw that rule, our own rule. And that's an excellent way to prevent hematomas. Did you suspect a, a port is too close to the epigastrics? Well, check them when you pull it out at the end of the procedure under vision. 
Yeah, some questions about position extra ports. Uh, there's no problem on position extra ports if you have any uh, any difficulty on your approach. Uh, a question from Dr. Ulano from Israel. It is essential to cut the lateral posterior rectal sheet and the its lateral approach of the medial and the medial aspect in the contralateral approach. Uh, essential is dependent on the case as you show you try to see and get exposure, but don't hesitate to cut. If you, the patient has a higher arcuate line, sometimes you don't need. Sometimes the patient has a low arcuate line, you do need to cut the arcuate line. So I think that's the best answer. Yep, so that, we have several questions that are kind of repetitive. I think we approach most of them and I really apologize for the uh, latest one that we have no time to go over them. Uh, I just want to stress my gratitude to Jorge uh, for his availability to do this and let everyone aware that this lecture will be available to be uh, replayed and watched again in our uh, website, herneu.com. We have the BD lectures area and that lecture probably tomorrow will be available to be watched again. And I'm pretty sure that Jorge is very available to anyone that has any question, just so uh, you can contact me or him, and we'll be more than happy to uh, address those questions. So with that, I, I, I need to finalize here and leave here our invitation for, to, for tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll have a little bit of different flavor on the same subject ETAP, but we are going to show for ventral harness with Dr. Swope. He promised me an uh, interesting interactive presentation with a lot of videos on his technique for ETAP robotic ventral corner repair. So tomorrow, if I'm not wrong at 8 a.m., but perhaps Jen can confirm this to everyone. Jorge, thank you so much again, Thank and you. please be safe. Thank you, my friend. Same there.